Now, in order to talk about convergence, we need to first of all define what objects we have that might converge, what sets they come from or live in, so to speak. And then we'll also need to define a notion of distance. So let's take a familiar example. Let's just start with um, R2 and the points in two dimensional real space. So let's pick any point here. Any point here is described by its X coordinate and its Y coordinate. <clears throat> and let's take another point. Now there's a natural notion of distance here, which is the length of the shortest line you could draw between those two points. And of course, the way we compute it is straightforward. Let's say A is the difference between the X coordinates of the two dots, and B is the difference between the Y coordinates of the two dots, if this distance is C. And of course, we have that C is simply the square root of A squared plus B squared. That's not the only valid way to measure distance in this space, but it's a natural one. And let's go with it. Now, to talk about convergence, we're going to need an infinite sequence of points in this space. Um, let's call our points Zs. Let's say each one is number is called Z, is enumerated by N. And there is infinitely many of them. So n goes from 0 to infinity. Now let's plot these points here. Obviously, there is an infinite number of them. Let's say this is, sorry, let's say this is z0. And this is Z1, this is Z2, and so on. They could go on forever, but there's a sense in which maybe they don't go on forever, which is that what if it turns out that these points actually get closer and closer together? There's something called the Cauchy property, which defines what it means to get closer and closer together. And that is that if you think of any positive number, so any possible distance that there might be between two adjacent points in this sequence, the Cauchy property means that for any positive number, however small, there's always gonna be some number, some number n, so that any two elements of this infinite sequence of points are all closer together than um, that arbitrary positive number that you picked, however small, if, n, if this number n is large enough, so to speak. So for any small number, there's going to be some point in the sequence, some cutoff beyond which all of the remaining elements in the sequence, all of the remaining points are closer together than that arbitrary positive number. That's one notion. The second notion is the notion of convergence. Convergence is actually a little different. Convergence is the idea that there's some point, and let's call it Z star, such that there is some point in this sequence again, some n, so that if um, this number, this index is larger than that number n, then for any arbitrarily small positive number, let's call it epsilon, the distance between all the z's, all the points beyond that threshold, is less than your arbitrary positive number. 
In other words, for any distance, there's always a point, some, some, uh, some points in the sequence beyond which um, all the elements are closer than that arbitrary small positive number epsilon. So the Cauchy property and convergence sounds similar, but the Cauchy property has to do with the elements in this sequence getting closer to each other. Whereas convergence is the idea that the elements of this sequence get closer and closer to some Z star. It's not quite the same thing, but if you have some space, some set, such that all sequences that satisfy the Cauchy property necessarily converge to some point, then we say that that space, that set is complete, okay? And this space that we're looking at right now, uh, the space of R2, two-dimensional real numbers, has that property. It is a complete space. All sequences of this kind with a Cauchy property are going to converge to something. Very well. So that is a familiar context. Let's get rid of it. The next question is, how do we talk about things like distance and convergence in the context of functions? Well, let's draw a couple of functions. Here is one function. Let's call it f of x. And here is another function. Let's call it g of x. Now the first thing we need is a way of measuring distance between functions. And we're going to find a convenient way of determining the distance between the functions as being the supremum, which we define as the supremum of the distance between f of x and g of x. We know from the example we discussed before what it means to have a distance between two points. In fact, the example we looked at was even more complicated because distance could have two dimensions. So here we're only talking about vertical distance. And what we're looking at is the supremum of the distance between these two lines. Uh, supremum is more or less the same thing as the maximum, except that it could be a limit. It may not be something that it actually attains. You don't need to worry about that right now. Um, now, where is the supremum here in this particular example? Um, it's actually here, right? At x equals zero. That just happens to be the way I drew it. But now that we have a way of defining distance between functions, we now have a tool for discussing convergence between functions. So two functions, or rather a sequence of functions, because remember what we're interested in is convergence, so we need an infinite sequence of the thing we're talking about. An infinite sequence of functions converges if there is some function, we could call it f star, towards which if you give me any arbitrary number epsilon past some point in the sequence, their distance measured in this way is smaller than epsilon for all the elements above that. Similarly, there's the same notion of Cauchy. A Cauchy sequence is going to be one where you have a whole sequence of functions such that 
judged by this criterion, they get closer and closer and closer to each other. Finally, the set of such functions is going to be complete if it turns out that every Cauchy, every Cauchy sequence um, of functions converges to something, to some F star. And you should feel some intuition that just given the fact that um, the space over which these functions are defined is complete, given the subnorm, means that, given this definition of distance rather, sorry, means that the, the function space should itself inherit that property, the property of completeness. And that's more or less right. <clears throat> Now, the way I've drawn these functions is maybe a bit um, specific, because notice that both of the functions that I drew are continuous. Continuous means that um, you know one dot follows on from another, so to speak. Um, if you make an arbitrarily small circle around any particular point in this function, you're always going to find another point of the function inside. That's what continuity means, as opposed to, let's say, a step function or a function that otherwise jumps. And so, remember early on I said we're going to have to think about exactly what kinds of functions we're going to consider. In this context, we are going to consider continuous functions. So things that jump like this are not in our, going to be in our minds going forward. We're only going to focus on continuous functions. And for the time being, for convenience, we're also going to think of functions that are not only continuous, but also bounded. That is, there is some limit beyond which they do not go. And what we're going to be able to show fairly in a fairly straightforward manner is that this space, the space of continuous and bounded functions, is also complete. As I mentioned, you can kind of think of it as something you can inherit from the fact that each of these, <clears throat> um, the arguments of these functions come from a complete space and the way I've drawn it, these are functions of R1. So they only take one number as an argument, but in principle, this also applies to Rn. So an arbitrarily large number of arguments. <clears throat> these functions are going to um, also live in a complete space, which means that any sequence of these functions that has a Cauchy property is going to converge to something. And that result is something that's going to be very useful for us in understanding why it is that dynamic programming works. One last thing I'd like to say is that showing this, showing the completeness of the space and showing that what we're going to do in dynamic programming is meaningful is going to be very easy in the case of bounded functions because we've kind of trapped them, right? So we know they have to converge to something. In the case of unbounded functions, it's going to be a little more tricky. And in typical economic applications, we will be thinking about unbounded functions, but let's just put that aside for now and deal with those um, quite important details a little later on because the general intuition is not going to depend on those details. <clears throat>